we normally do? Do we introduce ourselves? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Talking Lab Live! My name is Lucy, I'm a speech and language therapist and I'm the founder and proud director of Talking Lab. Um, my name is Sophie, I am a recently finished my competencies, no longer a newly qualified professional speech Woo-hoo! and language therapist and I also work at Talking Lab. Here at Talking Lab, we are obsessed with communication. So we want every single episode to explore lots of different areas of communication through the lens of a speech and language therapist, which is us. In this episode of Talking Lab Live, I'm sharing the incredible story of Jean-Dominique Bobby a French fashion magazine editor who suffered a devastating stroke at the age of 43 in December 1995, which resulted in locked-in syndrome, a state of total paralysis in every part of his body except his eyes. Jean Do, as he was known to his friends, had to learn a new way of communicating with the support of his talented and dedicated speech and language therapist who introduced a letter-based system allowing Jean Doe to spell out words using just his left eye. It's an inspirational story of persevering through the most extreme circumstances to be able to communicate and it's a story that's always stayed with me through first hearing about it as a little girl. In our communication check-in, we're reflecting on our experience at the conference in London hosted by the Association of Speech and Language Therapists in Independent Practice. Sophie confesses to not knowing her fiancé's year of birth, and I'm reminiscing on my amazing time as a bridesmaid for my friend this weekend. This week at Talking Lab, we are loving Chat GPT, and Sophie shares her story of how she was first introduced to the technology and how she uses it to carry out tasks in all areas of her personal and professional life, including writing and illustrating a story about a goat who goes to war. That's all coming up right now in this episode of Talking Lab Live! Talking Lab is an independent speech and language therapy service provider. We are a team of two therapists dedicated to improving lives by supporting communication. We provide assessment and support for families of children and young people aged 0 to 25. And you can enjoy sessions in the comfort of your own home, online or at our clinic space in Waterlooville in Hampshire. We offer flexible appointment times and we promise to never put you on a waiting list. Check out our website at talking-lab.com for a full list of our services and prices. There's an option to submit an inquiry where we will call you back for a free, no obligation consultation. If you have communication concerns, we'd love to talk to you. So, communication check-in time. What have we been up to since the last podcast? There's been a lot going on. There has been a lot going on. So we went to an ASLTIP conference together. That's right. So ASLTIP, which is our Association of Speech and Language Therapists in Independent Practice. And that was in London. It was. We got to do a little day trip to London. Yeah, I went on the train. Weren't effect- affected by the strikes. Luckily. Um, and it was a lovely, lovely event. It was the 35th anniversary of ASLTIP. Same age as me. Same age as you. Yeah. Apparently Should have big... definitely got a picture of you with a big 35 balloons. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have a big joint birthday for our 40th. Me and I <laughs> And it was so nice to catch up with some other independent speeches because aren't they just the nicest bunch? Oh, definitely. And there's been so many independent speech language therapists that I've got to meet through like neurodivergent groups or just our local group that I talk to so infrequently but have never met in person so it's really nice to put a face to the name and actually just see people and just even hug people I hugged so many people that day <laughs> you did you did and I thought I saw my friend Emma who I hadn't seen for 11 years that was really lovely and there were some excellent talks weren't there it was the whole day was just so 
fascinating and it was really well put together there was great food there was even yeah. drinks afterwards I just felt very accommodated throughout the whole experience yeah and a real bargain price I thought as well I was really happy with that um yeah just so nice to hear about the work that people are doing the dedication to you know service improvement across the board to say that we are technically a group of people who are all quote unquote in competition with each other Mm -hmm. you know there couldn't be more of a family feel and less of a competitive feel I think I didn't feel a single bit of competition when I was there it just felt so friendly so welcoming um and so funny at times like I think my takeaway from that day is definitely how chat GBT can help the practice like that was such a comedic and engaging speech that she gave it like was it was so funny. brilliant and you were just nudging me the whole time like I told you like <laughs> and we need to get on it so I need you to give me a proper tutorial and I think that like there's probably this misconception that independent speech therapists just want to you know make a load of money and it's all about you know we branch out from the NHS because we want to make more money than them mm-hmm. and I think for every single independent speech therapist I know I would probably say for all of them you know nobody sets out to train to be a speech therapist with the idea that like this is going to make me rich Definitely. you know we all set out to be I want to help people mm-hmm. and I feel like everyone who is in independent practice now started out in government practice of some kind Mm -hmm. um but left because they weren't able to help people in the way that they wanted to definitely definitely and I I thought it was such a shame hearing from people talking within the group about how there are some local authorities that aren't accepting independent practitioner reports because they're not the NHS Mm. and I also didn't realize until that day that we're the only healthcare profession that have a separate independent body that you can join if you're an independent practice there's no such thing as the association of independent occupational therapists no, no such thing as the in- association of independent educational psychologists or whichever oh, yeah yeah we've organized ourselves really well we have. yeah and it could be a really lonely place i think without our sort of i mean we're so lucky because we have each other but as an independent practitioner you definitely do feel like an island um yeah, especially when there are other organisations that aren't as accepting of you and they have these misconceptions about you. Um, so it's so nice for us all to get together because we all face the same challenges. Definitely, and I thought they addressed that really well at the conference at how more we've moved forward over the recent years and how much we've got a better relationship with the Royal College of Speech Language Therapy yeah. as well as Asseltip, how we are exactly that. We're all aiming for the same goal, so we should all be working collectively. Yeah, part of the same happy family. What else has been going on? You've been giving notice. Twice. <laughs> I gave notice twice. Um, yes, I gave notice last week to get married, which is so exciting. Whoop, whoop. Um, How many months away is it now? Uh, How many sleeps? Well, oh God, actually don't know. I actually <laughs> don't know. So the legal paperwork side is next month. So the fact that I can say Whoa. next month I'm getting married is mental. So that's the like legal official. That's the legal paperwork Whoa. side. Next month. Oh my God. And then the wedding is August. Oh so goodness. yeah, it's soon coming around. And Hindu is June. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. And I realised the other day when my friend asked, I've been telling everyone it's two nights, but I've actually booked three. Oh yeah, I was confused about this. <laughs> so what happened with that? So I thought I'd book just Friday and Saturday night for the bargain price of £75. Yeah. Um, but when I looked, it's actually Friday, Saturday and Sunday night for the bargain price of £75. I mean, who is making money on that? That is ridiculous. It's crazy. It was, I booked it just after Christmas, so I got a Boxing Day sale, oh. and it was something crazy, like 50-something percent off. Like, it was mental. Yeah, going back to the wedding, the yeah. wedding is in August. We gave notice on Tuesday. Um, my partner did get my date of birth wrong, which I found hilarious. Oh, funny. my God, Jace. Why? <laughs> How? Um, he said 1993. Okay, which is close yeah, yeah. but to be fair in his defense when the guy asked me what his date of birth was I was like um he's 37 so <laughs> and then I was like oh I'm really bad at quick mouse oh, 1987 you didn't think to like double check this information before you went in no right yeah okay. no I had no idea what they'd asked me <laughs> um when I'd called beforehand she had to have a really serious conversation and she's like, you need so much identification because we need to check that you have a right to marry in the UK, that you're a citizen, um, that you're not related. And I was like, oh my God, the fact they have to check we're not related just 
blew my mind. Yeah. But we did it on Tuesday, and then turns out we didn't have all the right documentation, so we had to do it again on Thursday. <laughs> So we've now officially given notice. Oh, well done. And so far, no one has objected. Fingers crossed. No one has objected Great. so far. Yeah. And if you're going to, don't. No, I won't. I probably won't. <laughs> um, I saw my friend Hannah at the weekend, and she is about to have a baby. And she's not married, and she's got a double barrel surname. Uh-huh. And then her partner has just one surname. And so I was like, what's the baby going to be? Is it going to go for the triple? Are you going to mash them together? Yeah. And she was like, oh, I don't know. It's so complicated, blah, blah, blah. And then she was like, maybe I'll just come up with a whole new name. And I was like, oh, my friend has got this great name. I was like, her name is Sophie. It's going to be Sophie Rainbird. And she was like, I love that. She's like, maybe it's such we'll a just name. be that. Yeah. It's such a great name. <laughs> so then her partner showed up and we were like, right, your new name is going to be James Rainbird. And he was like, what? Why? And we were like, we just love it. It's a such great a great name. But that was one of the difficulties of giving notice as well. So, um, Previously, Jace has changed his name multiple times over the years. Yeah. So the notice not because he's a criminal, I should add. No, no, not because he's a criminal. <laughs> and also, his legal name is actually Daniel, just to confuse people even further. Yeah. So sure. our notice <laughs> says Daniel Paul Rainbird, previously known as Daniel Paul King, previously known as Daniel Paul Shaw. Wants to marry Sophie Bradshaw. <laughs> <laughs> Boring old. <Sophie. laughs> I mean, what a middle name. <laughs> talking about things and you had done one last weekend i did oh i'm still riding the high of being a bridesmaid for the second time for my lovely friend hannah a different hannah um so yeah i lived with her when we were at uni back way back when and um yeah she got married in one of these like proper proper wedding venues you know the big wedding hall and we stayed all the bridesmaids stayed in a little gatekeeper's cottage the night nice. before and then the next day they shifted us all over to the bridal suite and we all got ready there and we had our oh, hair and makeup so done it was so nice and I really loved the hairstylist because I've had my hair done for a wedding before and they've been a bit like oh we can't we can't work with this with this so we have to like straighten it all out and then recurl it in the way that we like is that because you have hair. naturally curly hair yeah exactly and I just feel like please don't treat me as like a straight haired person because that's not what I am so I was really like yeah. on it and I was like I don't want any heat on my hair I just want you to like arrange it nicely and they were so nice and they were like we love natural curls like why would we ever straighten out natural, natural curls like you know we just you know that's so lovely so yeah they just really delicately arranged it in a really nice way. beautiful ceremony there was a Kaylee Kaylee. Yeah, Kaylee. You know, that's like the kind of Celtic dancing where oh. you do it in partners and they call that like do si do. I don't like... know why. I always thought it began with a G. Yeah, I just love the Kaylee. And just like you get to dance with like everyone in the room and you're just like running around and like swapping partners and doing all these moves. And I just absolutely love it. That was great. Um, and then, yeah, we stayed in the actual venue, which mm-hmm. is so nice because you can just keep running up to your room and yeah. going to the toilet and getting your stuff or leaving your bag there. Um, we had a lovely night in the hotel, so I had two nights with no baby, so I've like unbroken wow. sleep, but I feel like I'm nursing a bit of a two-day hangover now, so I don't really drink anymore. I did have a few glasses of Prosecco. That's what happens now, you've, you've hit 35. I know, exactly, it's all downhill. I'm, I'm genuinely like, uh, maybe it's worth never, never. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> what was your um, dress like? Uh, it was really nice, so she was a very bride chiller, and she said... Um, you can choose your own dresses and just make them some variation of like a blush pink. Okay. So I found one on ASOS that had little cap sleeves and it was like a V-neck so I could still pump every three hours. Love that. <laughs> without having to take the dress off. Um, and ASOS has like a petite range for short people so nice. I didn't have to get it taken up or anything. So we all had like different pinks, which in theory I felt like should have clashed, but actually they looked so nice no, together. No, it's so complimentary. Yeah, so we just looked like a really nice... um like a, a bunch of flowers, a little bit actually. And what did you call it? A bride chiller. Bride chiller, yeah. I've never heard of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what you'll be as well. It's like the opposite of a bride chiller. So bride chiller. Awesome. Oh, that looks beautiful. Yeah, so like all really different and just like, yeah. No, that's it's really so complimentary. Nice. Yeah, so well, that was lovely. Jokes aside, so I'm currently, I've got two out of three bridesmaids dress sorted. And um, the bridesmaids have got so frustrated with me because I have been so laid back with what they can choose. Um, I was like, my criteria is burgundy and floor length, and that's it. And they're like, we well, just pick a dress. <laughs> just be the bride and pick a dress. I'm like, whatever makes you happy, whatever oh. you're comfortable in. As long as it's this colour and it's floor length, they're like, just pick a style. <laughs> T 
today's episode, I have got another story for you. Okay. Because we love a story, don't we? We love a story. And this is the story of the diving bell and the butterfly. Okay. Is this a story you've heard of before? I've never heard of this before. I don't know if you're about to tell me a nursery rhyme, a documentary, (laughs) a kid's book. Is this a film? (laughs) So it's about a man with locked-in syndrome. Okay. Have you heard of locked-in syndrome? I have heard of locked-in syndrome, but I don't feel I could confidently describe what it was. So basically... Back in the 90s, possibly before you were even born. What year were you born? 95. Oh, okay. So you were you were born. So in December 95, um, a man called Jean-Dominique Bobby. What a fantastic name. He was unsurprisingly a French man, mm-hmm. went by the nickname jean Do to his friends. Um, he had a massive stroke at the age of 43. Okay. So really young to be having a stroke. And basically... The, so I, I cheated, really, because there is a book about this event, um, but I watched the film because I'm lazy and I like to watch films. Um, I mean, I'm not going to judge you. I am autistic and cannot process books fast enough. I read the same <laughs> sentence five times. So if someone's going to present it to me in a visual format, then hey, let's go. <laughs> you need to get more on the audiobooks before like, you'd be a real audiobook convert. I can do audiobooks, but then... Um, Sorry to sidetrack completely. I I was listening to Darren Brown's Happy and there were so many quotes from that that I was like, oh, I really want to like highlight this and peg it. But because it was in an audio book, I was like, I'm never going to find this again. Yeah, true. True. Anyway. So yeah, the book and the film are called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And the beginning of the film is this guy, you have little clips of him enjoying his life out and about because he was the editor of Elle magazine in France so yeah high powered job very successful living his best life and this was actual clips of him or is this kind of like video reconstruction as to what his life would have looked like yeah it's purely dramatization so all all actors Mm -hmm. and then he suddenly wakes up in a hospital bed and there are people like you see from his point of view and there are people leaning over him and saying Mm -hmm. oh Mr Bobby you've had it's all subtitled you've had um a stroke you're in hospital um and he's talking you can hear him talking because you're from his point of view but they're just completely ignoring him and they're saying oh can you can you um you know can you hear us and he's saying yes I can hear you and they're going okay no response yet and he's like oh my god they can't hear me um basically he thinks he's talking but nothing is moving so the only thing that he was able to move were his eyes Wow. So they knew that he was kind of in there Mm -hmm. because his eyes would track them around the room and, you know, he was blinking in response to them. Um, So it was obviously like, it wasn't like the lights were on but no one's home situation. And do you know if kind of locked-in syndrome was previously kind of recorded before? Oh, I don't actually. Because I wondered if... You know, he was one of the first that we kind of know of officially or... No, it's definitely been around before because I remember in the film them saying, this is the name of your condition, it's called locked-in syndrome, it's extremely rare. Mm. So possibly everyone that he was dealing with, this might have been the first time that they'd seen it. Um, But it it had definitely been around. Um, So they were kind of saying, we're not really sure what your progress is going to look like. Um, But yeah, he could only move his eyes and everyone was aware of that fact quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Um... And then he was having his kind of checks and they were like, oh, we really don't like the look of one of these eyes. His right eye is kind of looking not great. It's got an infection or it's starting to degenerate in some way or something. So they were oh like, God. we're going to we're gonna sew that one up. What? So, yeah. Oh, my God. Horrifying. And then as the, as the viewer, you see from his point of view, him literally watching as the needle goes under his eyelid and it sews up that right eye. And, and so, can you feel this? Um. I don't know. I would I would hope that they applied some kind of local anaesthetic. I would hope so. Yeah, he wasn't like internally screaming or anything, but yeah, just watching that eye being oh, so that'd be that horrifying. Up. So then he was reduced to just his left eye, and that's the only thing that he could move. So then we're introduced as the viewers to um, two clinicians, so a speech and language therapist and a physiotherapist, mm-hmm. and she was called uh, Henrietta, and she was so lovely in the film. I think, I imagine she was really lovely in real life as well. And the Henrietta's the speech therapist. The speech therapist, yeah, so we love her. And she was like, right, I'm going to help you with your communication, because up until that point, literally the clinicians would just come in and talk at him and kind of update him on his condition, um, but not really have any way of him communicating back to them, and she was like, right, I'm going to get a proper system. So, up until that point, they would they just established a very basic form of communication, which is blink once for yes and mm-hmm. twice for no, just with his left eye. So he could answer yes and no questions, and that was it. 
And then she said, okay, we're going to get a proper communication system for you. So what she did, because this was back in the 90s, so if you've got to remember, we didn't have fancy eye gaze, we didn't we have didn't. apps or anything like that. We didn't. Did we have Google? <laughs> I think I'm older than Google. You think you're older than Google? Yeah. What? Unsure. I don't remember using Google in the 90s. I don't remember Google coming into my psyche at all until the 2000s, I would say, but I don't know. Yeah, basic technology. Yeah. So she said, I've devised a board with the letters of the alphabet mm -hmm. um, and instead of the order of the alphabet, so ABC, um, they're organised in the order of frequency of use in the French alphabet. So the letters that come up most frequently in French words. Yeah. Um, so the starting letters were E, S, A, R, I, N, T. Which makes sense. Yeah. So she would just start reading out those letters and then she was like, blink when you, when I've reached a letter that you want to use. Um, and then she would ask him a question and she'd start saying these letters and at the beginning he was really frustrated and he was like, oh, this is too stressful, you know, you're reading the letters too fast and he would blink and she would be like, S, was that S? And he would be thinking, oh no, that's not the right letter and she was like, blink rapidly if I've got the if I've got the letter wrong. So, you know, it really took some time to train the two of them That was going to be my next question is, mm. how would you then communicate that that isn't what I wanted? I yeah. can't, like, look left to turn back or... No. Yeah, they right. didn't even... Um, yeah, they didn't come across that, actually. Because, yeah, he could move his eyeball left to right. So they could have come up with a system for not just blinking, but moving your yeah, eye. Yeah, like looking in one direction. Yeah. Like, left means... Like, you've got it, right means no, skip to the next one or something. Yeah, yeah. Or like, yeah, look left to wipe it and look right to go back to the previous word or something. But anyway, you know, this is a film, so they might have left some stuff out. It might have differed mm. from what actually happened. Um, so, yeah, at the beginning, he was really suicidal um, because he was just like, this is terrible. I had a great life. I've got a couple of kids. I've got a girlfriend. And now I'm reduced to completely paralysed. I have to have someone do everything for me. I can't go to the toilet. Mm. I can't wash myself. I can't eat. I think he was fed through a tube or maybe a peg fed through his stomach. Um, and so one of the first things that he spelled out with the system was, I want death. Oh, that is heartbreaking. Yeah. And in the film, the speech therapist gets really upset and she's like, how dare you say that? I'm like, no. And then she kind of stormed off. How dare off. you say that? <laughs> oh, the audacity of this woman <laughs> to be like, I've provided you the communication, but it's not what I want you to say. Yeah. But then she comes back in straight away and she was like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm ready to, to have another go. So, yeah, he, you know, they make this communication system together. And he, oh, two blinks signify the end of a word. So two blinks, end of a word. Okay. Multiple blinking, rapid blinking is you messed up. Repeat that letter again. Um, so in the film, he has a friend come to see him. Um, and there was this crazy like side story about the friend because basically they tell us that a few years ago, this friend um, needed to get to a different country and Jean-Dominique was also going there. Um, but the friend needed to get there more urgently. So Jean-Dominique gave him his seat on the flight Oh. And so his friend took his seat on the flight and the flight ended up being um, hijacked. Oh, my God. Um, and this friend spent four years as a hostage. Oh, my God. I know. And so John Dominique, like, from his point of view, was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. I feel so guilty. I never even got in touch with this guy when I knew heard he was released. And But, you know, he came to see him. And they, he was kind of like, yeah, these crazy things have, have happened to us. So that was just, like, a wild side story. And I was like, that, oh is, a, that is a film in itself. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. And then... So he gets used to kind of communicating in this way. He gets used mm -hmm. to his new normal. At first he says, I don't want to see my kids. I don't want them to see me like this. But then eventually he does see them and his ex-wife is a real support, the mother of his children. And she yes. comes up and really advocates for him. Um, and then he communicates with this system. So everyone who comes to visit him has to learn you know, they, they get given the board and they have to learn yeah. a bit of this way of communicating with him. So they get used to saying it and they get really fast in the film. You can see them going like, A -S -A -R -E -E, you know, and he's just blinking away. So it does become quite, quite quick. Um, and then when he was the editor of Elle, he um, had arranged a contract with a publisher to write a book. 
Okay. And so he communicates with the speech therapist. He says, ring this person and tell them I want to go ahead and write the book. Oh my God. What yeah. A high achievement. I know. So the speech therapist rings the publisher and she's like, um, I've got John Dominique here. Um, he would like to go ahead and write the book. And they were like, oh my God, we heard he had this massive stroke. He's completely paralyzed. And she was like, no, he can talk. He can talk. You know, he talks with his eyelids, but he can talk. Um, and he wants to write this book. So they were like, fine. So they sent someone over um, to kind of work with him um, to write this book. So she had to learn the communication system and she would sit with him for hours and hours. And he wrote a whole book. Um, so it took them, they would work for three hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. And it took him two months to write this book, which is The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. So the story of wow. kind of what happened to him. Which is faster than most authors these days. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that's incredible. Isn't it? And I haven't actually read the book, but I'm really tempted to because, yeah, it's not like... I mean, I wonder how much editing there was in that. I wonder once mm. he'd written it, would they then go back and read it and then he would kind of like stop and be like, no, change that bit. You know, it must be really hard yeah. to, to edit it, to describe all those things about wanting to change it and, oh no, take that paragraph and put it earlier. Like, would he do all that through the eye blinking or was it just like a one shot? Honestly, I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to Google and see kind of what it says. And you said this book was about what exactly? So the book, it was called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly and it was about his experience of having this stroke, wow. being in hospital and learning to communicate with the system and uh, probably just kind of his reflections on that whole experience yeah. um, and what that meant to him. Um, so they used that, uh, like yeah, it's kind of like a memoir, so they use that as the basis of the film because it's from his point of view. So he was he would have been describing seeing his eyelid being sewn shut and meeting the therapist and those feelings of frustration. And yeah, so it's amazing. And... Um, yeah, and then so he actually, really sadly, 10 days after the book was published, he died of pneumonia oh, no. quite unexpectedly. Yeah. That's heartbreaking. It's really sad, isn't it? And it was really out of nowhere because I think all through people were thinking, you know, we might be able to pr make progress, he mm -hmm. might be able to get better. Like the physiotherapist was always coming in and there were little glimmers of progress here and there. Like he was on a standing frame once and doing something and then there was a fly on his head and he managed to like, I think, turn his head or something to try and get the fly off and everyone was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, you turned your head. Like this is unbelievable. You've not been able to do anything like that. And they would do lots of things with his mouth and trying to get him to exercise his tongue and things like that, getting ready for swallowing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he never got to do any of that because he died of pneumonia. It must be a big risk of he was probably aspirating because of his difficulty swallowing I didn't mm -hmm. really go into all of that but that was a likely cause um and then the very end of the film is the scene of his actual accident so he was driving with his son in the car and they were on their way to the theatre and then suddenly like the car slows down and the son is like what's wrong dad what's wrong dad and then you hear all this screaming and the kid like running off and then coming back and that's kind of like the ending scenes you know, the beginning of his journey with that. Wow. Um, yeah, but it was it was really amazing, really powerful. I highly recommend it. Um, and just, yeah, really, yeah, a really powerful message about overcoming things like that and what, you know, making the best of a situation and what you can achieve, even though it feels like you've got so little to work with. But how frustrating that must have been for him. Oh, God, yeah. And I find... The, the, I don't know if it's appropriate to say, but I, I do find locked in syndrome fascinating, and I think it's because it's it's so unknown and it, it's so powerful that that speech therapist could find a way to tap into his personality and who he was just by simple eye movements, which is something we take for granted. Yeah, every single day. Um, I'd love to know more about other people that have had the condition and whether they were able to find a communication system that was suitable for them or whether they made any progress or just, just more about it in general. I just find it fascinating. Yeah, isn't it? And obviously nowadays, if that happened, they would just really quickly set someone up with eye gaze technology because eye gaze technology is amazing now. I mean, I've never seen any in 
real life. I don't know whether you have. I have seen in real life. Um, so there's a couple of different options as to what I've seen. I've seen like what was in the story where there's kind of the, the visual board. It's usually kind of a perspex board that you'll hold in front of someone's face and even they'll have like an alphabet with again high frequency words put together high frequency letters sorry not words put together yeah um or i've had ones with pictures so there'll be a choice of pictures and they'll kind of buy gates with those and that's mm. kind of a more basic principle um or i've seen people that have been in very early stages of eye gaze technology where they will just kind of hold up pictures or words or something in front and then their eyes can track which is their choice um or you've got these days our phones that are with us all the time there's apps i don't know if they're free but you can just download on your phone that now do eye gaze tracking and support really? communication it's fascinating yeah because yeah the tech is incredible now aren't there where it's machines and somehow the machine knows uh, it's attached to a camera is it yeah so you'll have your phone with your front facing camera kind yeah. of facing you and then it will bring up options kind of on the phone screen and then it tracks your eye movement and I, I don't know the ins and outs of it enough but there's a certain way that you move your eyes or whether you hover over one of those words mm. for a slight second it will make that your choice or you can go into categories depending on how complex it is so if you're quite um quite used to it I imagine they've got different things like as we would with any other AAC board we have so it might be right there's a category about food okay we go into that one it'll be like lunch okay um crisps different sandwich choices whatever and they can make full conversations and lots of vocabulary just by tracking their eye movements so that's amazing isn't it so if that if he was around today and it happened to him he would have been able to establish that communication so much faster and being able to convey so much more about mm. what he wants and advocate for himself much more easily than just sitting there and listening to someone say letters, you know. He'd be able to bring up all those boards and, you know, I want this and let's talk about that and, oh, what am I, what's on my schedule today? You know, there'd be all those yeah. options, just communicating it all through his eye gaze. You went down such a beautiful path, whereas in my head, I was like, there could have been a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm, I'm still so impressed that he wrote a book in two months yeah like that's incredible with isn't it? watching people use those eye gaze trackers mm. with the um with the high frequency sounds even when they're quite fast it's still quite a slow process to to just achieve that in two months i find that i'm i'm flat no, 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 right. <laughs> yeah it's stranger than fiction you'd never guess that someone could write a book in two months using their left eye and that's it i could write a book in two months using both eyes and my hands yeah exactly it puts the rest of the world to shame um but yeah it really got me thinking about the power of communication and you know i've got a little six month old baby and i've been using eye gaze with him for mm -hmm. so long that's how he makes his choices about what he's going to wear in the morning and yeah. i offer him his two choices shall we wear your dinosaur vest or your tractor vest dinosaur vest and then i'll hold them up and he'll just look up at me and he understands as soon as he hears you choose he knows right which one am i going to look at and his eyes will just snap like that and he'll look at one of them and i'll say oh you chose dinosaur vest great choosing so you know, there's there's never an excuse, is there? We say that to people that absolutely. You know, that if if a person is alive and awake, they can communicate with you, and they are communicating with you, and it's about tapping into what system suits them best. Um, but yeah, I think for so many people, that would be such a strange concept for them that I let my baby choose what he wears. Well, I'm a fully qualified <laughs> speech language therapist, and you brought baby boy into the office, and I observed you offering him choices, and even I looked at you like, oh interesting <laughs> it's yeah. so different but then I, I saw him look at you and yeah. gave a response in one direction at whichever you were holding I think it was like a nappy or something that you yeah. were offering or some trousers yeah um and it's it's fascinating and it, I've it's really something I'm going to take on board for when I have children hell gonna, yeah you are I'm gonna have to get Lucy's 101 um yeah. kids class yeah definitely. choices to babies yeah and just it's so good for their self-advocacy you know getting used to them being the decision maker or as much control as I can give to him at such an early age um it's just great and then now he's got better hand control so he started to kind of grab for what oh, he likes so adorable. yeah mainly he grabs it and shoves it in his mouth but oh. then I gently pries it off him like okay you chose the, <laughs> you chose the yellow top that's fine I'll put it on you um but yeah I'm just uh, I, it brings me so much joy knowing that he's made that decision and not me yeah uh, because I don't want to be the one that makes the, the decisions for him and I think a lot of our families probably struggle to 
delegate that power, especially quite early on. Definitely. And there's been a lot of families that I've spoken to that are like that, that exact thing of, yeah. oh, but it's not my choice. So then stripping it back and saying, well, no, because you've chosen the choices that you're offering. Yeah. So the clothes is a lovely example. Yeah. Pick two outfits that you're comfortable to offer as choices. So you've still got that power yeah. and you feel confident giving that choice. But then you've then offered them part of that power part of that involvement in that choice and then everyone's happy yeah exactly it's the the freedom with limits is like the Montessori approach so yeah if you because when I say you should be letting your child to choose what they want to wear then they might come back with well he just chooses fairy wings and a tutu every day (laughs) and it's like okay well choose your options first and then let him make the final decision you know present him with the information because yeah that we feel as as human beings, we feel much safer in a kind of closed option like that, don't we? You know, if Absolutely. I say to you, what do you want to eat tonight? You can eat anything in the world. That's a really overwhelming decision. Whereas if I said, should we have pizza or pasta tonight? You can be like, oh, yeah, don't have Absolutely. pizza, let's have pasta. And even giving the option of two of, do I want pizza or pasta? Even if I want none, it makes it so much easier for me to feel like I can make a choice. Because yeah. you haven't just left it so open-ended. Yeah. Because I'm like, actually, I don't want any of those. Okay, yeah. you could come in with another choice. Yeah. I'd be like, no, actually, this has made me realise I want uh, noodles. Yeah, I can, like, help you narrow it down a bit. It's like, okay, you don't want pizza or pasta. She's probably not feeling Italian. Yeah. Right, would you like noodles or soup? And so, exactly. you know, helping and you get a little bit closer. Parents also worry about that all the time. Well, what if I've given a choice and it's not something they want? Well, they will soon tell you. Absolutely. <laughs> it will be yes. very clear yes. it's not a choice they want (laughs) yeah as the kids get older and you're offering them two choices of outfit they will push both of them out of the way yeah even if they're at that pre-verbal stage if they're not happy with those things that you've offered so um yeah i'm hoping that more people will offer choices to their teeny tiny babies absolutely choices are incredibly powerful they are one of the best ways to improve communication yeah and going back to this locked in syndrome Mm -hmm. if I'm so sorry, I'm so bad with names, but if you didn't have that choice yeah. of looking through that board to pick those letters, he would never have communicated. Yeah, exactly. If she hadn't had the, the bright idea of introducing that, he might have just been stuck with yes, no, forever. So mad props to her. Henrietta, love her. Indeed. Yeah. So that was the story of um, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly by Jean-Dominique Bobby. And we'll put a link to the book in the show notes and also the film. I did have to pay for the film. I rented it off Sky. I couldn't find it anywhere for free. But well worth a watch, I think, if it's something that interests you. So now it's time for Talking Lab Loves. And you've got something that you love that you're going to talk about this week. I possibly love it a little bit too much, and um, that is ChatGPT. ChatGPT, right. Okay, remind me how it all works. Well, I can definitely give it a go. So, um, jokingly went on ChatGPT months ago after a friend was like, have you seen this new artificial intelligence generator? You can ask it anything. It will help you do whatever. You know, it can help you write essays or do some of your work or meal plan. And I was like, no, absolutely mental. And I can't remember what I initially used it for it might even be um my friend wanted a name for their business or something and I typed in I don't know um I I want to have a business business of selling xyz can you help me with a name yeah certainly instantly 10 results come up within seconds wow. and I was like this is fascinating and I was like oh but what if I don't want that and my friend was like well then tell it because it will learn from you and I was like what that's that's scary so I was like okay um actually I don't like number two and three um but number four sounds kind of on the right lines can you expand on that yes certainly 10 more answers and I was like, mm-hmm. what this is crazy um so I ran with it and I I remember that I'd used it to, so I make infographics for speech and language therapy and I was like, I've got all this data, I don't know how to kind of condense this. So I had all the data that I wanted to talk about, chucked it into chat DBT and I was like, can you make this prettier or easier to read? It's seconds. And I was like, oh my God. And I didn't feel like I necessarily need to proofread because it's already my work that I've put into it. It's just made it smaller. And it's just saved me so much time. And we're always of the ethos of let's work smarter, not harder. Absolutely. And I use it for everything. It is meal planned for me and it continuously learns from 
what I've inputted. So now it knows if it's meal planning from me, I will not accept any fish. <laughs> yes, I loved it when you showed me that conversation and you were like, meal plan, no fish please. And it came up with something and it had like prawns in it. And, and I was like, said, I said oh, no sorry. fish. <laughs> no, I always apologise. I'm do. like, oh, sorry, or please. Because I'm like, jokes aside, if the robot's up, rise. <laughs> yeah, like, and it's, it's always open like back to you, isn't it? It's like, oh, my, my mistake. I do apologise. Here you go. Yeah, and I'm always like, no problem. Yeah. Thanks for trying. <laughs> and it's just, I just can't get my head around how clever it was. Like, like didn't you tell her, oh, give me some options on like a tighter budget or something like that and it was like oh yeah sure here are some like lower cost recipes and like how how can it know that so uh, so they spoke about chat gbt at the asshole tip conference didn't they and i can't remember what year it's up to it might be 2022 or something but yeah. some clever human being created this artificial intelligence that had access to all of the world's information mm. on the internet up until about 2022 yeah. so if you asked it about something that happened this week it wouldn't have that updated information unless i'm assuming but don't quote me on this yeah. unless people had inputted that information themselves right. because jack gbt also learns from other users okay yeah. so if you were like I don't know if someone spent every single day going on this day, this is what happened in the world news. It'd probably learn from that and then have a bit more up to date information. Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, it's fascinating. You can use it for so many things in your life, but obviously you just need to be mindful as to, is that information actually true? Yeah. What it's giving you. Um, and just, yeah, double check. Yeah. And the, the talk they gave us, they said it's great for like a first draft and they yeah. can't replace a human, no. but it can do all of the legwork at the start. And then you just get to be the editor, oh, which gotcha. is so easy. And you got, it's right that like, complaint list of me the other day, didn't you? I did. <laughs> so you literally type in, right, here are all my points of what I want to complain about. Here's who I'm complaining to. Here's why I'm complaining. Yes, Sophie, no problem. Yeah. Da, 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 da. And I can, I'm, I'm still so resistant to it and I don't know why. And I, you were saying, you know, let, you know, just tell Jack PT, Jack, Chat GPT to write it. And I was like, no, because I, I'd have to give it all the information. And you're like, no, you don't. Let, let me do it for you. It's so simple. So and then simple. I read what it wrote and I was like, this is brilliant. It's so much better. It's, it's fascinating. And I had um, a friend recently who was looking to move jobs and we used Chat GPT to actually help write a cover letter for the job. And they ended up receiving an interview from this and you know it could have been because of chat gbt it might not have been but it was it was done to such a professional standard and it was just based off all the information that they provided so it doesn't feel like cheating in a way yeah it's just like a more efficient version of yourself yeah of what you could do if you spent hours trawling the internet for the information you needed exactly and you know in the olden days when we were writing cover letters people were either googling one online and copying that template anyway or being like oh mate you had an interview recently send us your cover letter let's have a look so you know and I don't feel that that's any different it's still your own work yeah the wedding I was at actually the best man speech um you know it was really funny it had loads of jokes in it it was really sensitive and personal to the couple and then his last line at the end the mic drop was um this speech was written by ChatGPT, and everyone Amazing. was like, roaring with laughter. Because obviously he has his own input as well, but it's just like, yeah, that is incredible. But well, all jokes aside, I'm going to see if I can, if it will let me log into my ChatGPT now, and if yeah. it will, I'm intrigued to see what nonsense I have searched <laughs> over the past. Oh, honestly, there's been meal planning. There's been um, the podcast name. Yes, we it searched really ChatGPT, um, and I like that it can give its own opinions as well like if we it wasn't just can you come up with some names for a podcast we then would come up with our name ourselves, and then you'd ask it what do you think of the name talking love loves and oh talking love live and it came back with an answer didn't it It was like ah talking love live conveys you know um information and also a fun chatty vibe and things like that crazy so um i've logged in and i'm slightly embarrassed (laughs) there is a Wedding planning, yes. wedding ideas, yeah. decorations, meal planning, Jace don't listen, our assistants, <laughs> <laughs> um, speech and language therapy, imposter syndrome, okay. and I just spoke to Jack GBT like it was my friend, it was the most bizarre conversation, but it was so helpful that it was like, you're not alone, other people feel this way, and I was yeah. like, oh my god, yeah. it's like talking to an actual human. Um, yeah, I, I wrote my friend a story at Christmas. Um, so she is really into goats and she's really into the war and it's the most <laughs> randomest mix of things and I was like right for Christmas I want to make her a story about everything that she loves so I input it into chat GPT and I was like right 
this is all the things that she loves can you please help me write a children's book because I've got no knowledge on doing it and it produced something and I was like "Mm, that's not what I wanted and Jace was like why don't you ask it to do it in the style of Dr Zeus and I was like what a brilliant idea and I was like can you put this in the style of Dr Zeus it's one of the best most craziest books I've ever read it was insane wasn't it and didn't it also make the pictures so um I think chat GBT pro so you can now pay for chat GBT and then yeah. you've then got access to the most up-to-date information yeah. and that I think in the United States can do um, image generating, but right. I don't think they can in the UK currently. Um, I used, I think it was Adobe artificial intelligence software, wow. but again, a similar principle that I was like, oh, I need a picture of a goat um, that went to war, please, <laughs> <laughs> as you do. And then it would just generate it based on what you said. So it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And I saw the finished product and it was amazing. And like, what a personal gift for your mate. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, thanks to ChatGPT. So it's yeah, from from the conference and from us, it's groundbreaking way to work smarter and not harder. Yeah, absolutely. And next step for me, I've got to just bite the bullet, rip that band aid off, and just install it on my phone and start doing it. I'm a little bit frightened. I need you to hold my hand. You've got nothing to be frightened of. I and I would be, I would love to hear from people that listen to what they what they use ChatGPT for. Yes. You know, yeah. what, what have you searched for? What crazy... I've, I've thrown myself out there at my crazy things. Yeah. And what I've searched for. A bit of inspo. So, yeah, chat GPT. Other AI programs are available, but that's the one you use, obviously. That is the one I use, just because mm-hmm. it was the one that was probably most mainstream and yeah. kind of come up on my social media. But, um, yeah, they spoke in the conference about others. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was others that she mentioned were potentially better just because they have more access to more up-to-date information. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to link them to this podcast, but off the top of my head, I cannot remember what any of them are called. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we'll just go with chat, chat GPT. Bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Chat GPT. I don't know what it sounds for either. She did tell us in the conference, um, it was like the G was generative, and then I forget what the other words. Chat generative pre-trained transformer. Pre-trained transformer. Wow. Oh, wow. That makes it sound like the Terminator, doesn't it? I was thinking more of like Transformers. Oh yeah, like the cars that turn into robots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Exactly, and that's why I'm so polite to chat GBT, because one day... Yes, could come busting in and they'll save the polite ones and mm-hmm. get rid of the rude ones. Exactly. Yeah. 